are in significant location because in 1962, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke here. We are here today to commemorate the writing of this wonderful letter. And to me, it answers all the questions, why? Why, why, why? Why the struggle? Why the marches? Why the boycotts? And um, he explains it here. And those of you who um, have your text, you'll see it says, in the spring of 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. and his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, targeted so peaceful demonstrations were aimed at ending segregation. The police <coughs> reacted violently with attack dogs and high pressure fire hoses. Hundreds of protesters, including King, were jailed. At first, King was criticized for taking on Birmingham. He received a letter from eight white clergymen, and they called his actions unwise and untimely. But he responded with his own letter, citing philosophers, religious scholars, and biblical figures to justify his actions. That was 50 years ago today, on April 16, 1963, sitting in the Birmingham jail, he started this letter. And today, all over the world, there are groups meeting in libraries and cultural centers <coughs> reading this letter. And I'm glad that Oakwood is part of that um, celebration today. And so we will begin our reading. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that come across my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I'm here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I, along with several members of my staff, I'm here because I was invited here, and I am here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I'm cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught 
and an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside alligator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I'm sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underly underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gain saying the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the courts. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than any other city in the nation. These are the hard, brutal facts of the case. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiations. Then, last September, came the opportunity to talk with leaders of Birmingham's economic community. In the course of the negotiations, certain promises were made by the merchants, for example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to a moratorium on all demonstrations. <coughs> As the weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. A few signs briefly removed, returned, and others remained. As in so many past experiences, our hopes had been blasted, and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. Then it occurred to us that Birmingham's mayoralty election was coming up in March, and we speedily decided to postpone action until after election day. When we discovered that the Commissioner of Public Safety, Eugene Bull Connor, had piled up enough votes to be in the runoff, we decided again to postpone action until the day after the runoff so that the demonstrations could not be used to cloud the issues. Like many others, we waited to see Mr. Connor defeated, and to this end, we endured postponement after postponement. Having aided in this community need, we felt that our direct action program could be delayed no longer. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? you are quite right for calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, 
but there is a type of constructive, nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so we must see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it would inevitably open the door to negotiation. <coughs> I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in monologue rather than dialogue. One of the basic points in your statement is that the action that I and my associates have taken in Birmingham is untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this query is that the new Birmingham administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before it will act. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and non-violent pressure. Lamentably, it is a historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Yeah, true. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture, but as one bold neighbor says, has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. Mm -hmm. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurors that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Yes. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers sm smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking daddy why do white people treat colored people so mean when you take a a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and your mother are never given the respected title Mrs., when you are harried day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting the degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Yeah. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over, yeah. and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Yeah. All right. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in the public schools, 
At first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. That's right. <laughs> I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now what's the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because Segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, Segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. Is not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? Thus, is it that I can urge Thus it is, I should say, that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right, and I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances, for they are morally wrong. Let us consider a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a numerical or a power majority group compels a minority group to obey but does not make binding on itself. This is difference made legal. By the same token, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Let me give another explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that as a result of being denied the right to vote, had no part in enacting or devising the law. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama, which set up that state's segregation laws, was democratically elected? Throughout Alabama, all sorts of devious methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some counties in which, even though Negroes constitute a majority of the population, not a single Negro is registered. Can any law enacted under such circumstances be considered democratically structured? Sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I have been arrested on a charge of parading without a permit. Now there is nothing wrong in having an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade. But such an ordinance becomes unjust when it is used to maintain segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and protest. I hope you are able to see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as would the rabid segregationist. That would lead to an anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that, that conscience tells him to, that is, is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice 
is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground of a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience in our own nation. The Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort, com comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at that time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to Christian faith were are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. I must take two honest confessions to you, my <laughs> Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white Margaret. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen counselor nor the Ku Klux Klanner but the white moderate who is more devoted in order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goals you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who maternalistically believes that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro the wait to wait for a more convenient season. Shadow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exists for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerous structure dams that flow that block the flow of social progress. I'd hope that the white mob would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase for transition from the obnoxious negative peace which the Negro passively accepts his unjust plight to a substantial and positive peace in which all men will <coughs> accept the dignity and worth of human personality. And actually we who engage in nonviolence direct action are not the creators of the tension. We merely bring it to the surface, the hidden tensions that already are alive. We bring it out in the open, where it can be seen and dealt with, and like a ball that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be open with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of the air and light, and justice must be exposed with all the tensions it is exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of natural opinion before it can be cured. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this a logical assertion? Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't this condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophy Philosophical inquiries precipitated the act by the misguided populace in which they made him drink hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? We must come to see that, as the federal courts have consistently affirmed, it is wrong to urge an individual to cease his efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because the quest may precipitate violence. Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it, can't, it can be gained. Consciously or unconsciously, 
he has seen he has been caught up by the zygos and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, the United States Negro is moving with a sense of great urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. If one recognizes this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why public <coughs> demonstrations are taking place. The Negro has many pent up resentments and latent frustrations, and he must release them. So let him march. Let him make prayer pilgrimages yes. to the city hall. Yes. Let him go on freedom rides mm -hmm. and try to understand why he must do so. Right. If, he, if his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontentment. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent may be channeled into the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. And now this approach is being termed extremist. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized <coughs> as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for, for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin an extremist? Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene on Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime, the crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality and thus fell below the environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and thereby rose above his environment. Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. Mm. I mm. wish you had commended the Negro sit and the demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of their great provocation. One day, the South will recognize its real heroes. Mm -hmm. They will be the James Merediths, with the noble sense of purpose that enables them to face jeering and hostile crowds, and with the agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. They will be old, oppressed, battered Negro women, symbolized in a 72-year-old woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with the sense of dignity, and when her people decided not to ride segregated buses, and who responded with an ungrammatical profundity to one who inquired of her lone weariness, my feet is tired, but my soul is at rest. They will be the young high school and college students, and the young ministers of the gospel, and a host of their elders, courageously and nonviolently sitting in at lunch counters and willingly going to jail for conscience sake. One day, the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for what is best in the American dream and for those sacred values, most sacred values, in our Judeo-Christian heritage thereby bringing our nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in their formation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Never before have I written so long a letter. I'm afraid it is too much, too long to take your precious time. 
I can assure you that it would have been much shorter if I were writing from a comfortable desk. Yes. But what else can one do when he's alone in a narrow jail cell mm -hmm. other than write long letters, Mama. think long thoughts, and pray long prayers? Yes. Amen. If I had said anything in this letter that overstates the truth and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I had said anything that understates the truth and indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. Mm -hmm. I hope this letter finds you strong in faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman yes. and a Christian brother. Mm -hmm. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. are still searching. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>